Thanks. Thanks for the marathon that y'all are on at, at this point today. Uh, you're crossing the two-hour mark of us pummeling you with questions. Let me let me pummel you with a few more on this. Mr. Levin, I'm going to come back to you because you're sufficiently warmed up there on it. And it's the issue of tiering that's come in. This has been an area that I've been working on for a while. The, the drug companies complain about the PBMs until they cooperate with them for tiering. Uh, that when it's time for a drug to go generic, uh, once the generic's about to be released, the PBM and the, and the branded drug, uh, they negotiate together some way to get a higher rebate fee if they'll put the generic drug on the branded tier, which means the copay for the consumer is more and it also is a higher cost uh, from Medicare at that point. This has been an issue. They're literally driving generic companies out and driving the prices higher for the consumer. At the same time, the PBM will come back and say, we're negotiating to get better prices for the consumer when they're actually not. Where am I wrong on this? I, I can see no fault in any of that logic. Okay, so how do we, how do we solve this? I, I, earlier was talked about accountability. I'm not sure who's looking at these formularies. I mean, if it's a Medicare formula, I think C, CMS has outsourced Medicare to these private companies, completely outsourced with very little oversight. So I think that CMS should look hard at this tiering issue you talked about. Also, honestly, in this self-funded plan space, I think big employer groups need to more carefully examine what their contracts say and what PBMs are doing. Okay, I, I would also, let me add one more element as well. Th there's been some studies and some conversation about what PBMs do to independent pharmacies, especially with the DIR fees, uh, with all the new quality bases that they literally invent every month or quarter. Uh, they'll retroactively change all their requirements on them. Uh, but it, it's been remarkable to me how many independent pharmacists have told me the same crazy story that they get a change in quality, they get a drive down in price, and then within about two weeks they'll get a call from one of the PBM owned pharmacies and saying, hey, we're trying to expand into your area. Would you like to merge into our pharmacy? Would you like to become one of us? So my challenge is a couple ways. What PBMs are doing, I believe, are actually driving our independent pharmacies and our rural pharmacies into submission or gone uh, from there. And that's a real problem. And the second thing we've seen, even VA recently, uh, cooperating with a PBM uh, to basically cut off thousands of rural pharmacies around the country and say, you're no longer going to do VA benefits. You've got to do mail order through our PBM to be able to do it, which will kill our pharmacies. Have you seen this as just independent stories or has anyone seen this as an actual trend that's going on? The, the story you told about PBMs aggressively auditing a, a independent pharmacy and then offering to buy that pharmacy, I've seen that for 10 years. I've seen that trend. The irony also, Senator, is that when PBMs buy these pharmacies, they're literally buying them with their own money because PBMs have these DRF fees that are pure profit, and it has fueled this, uh, this proliferation of PBMs buying, uh, buying up pharmacies. The thing about the VA and TRICARE, I think, you know, I looked at those, uh, the, the, whatever information is public about the TRICARE bid, I was able to see. There was two PBMs that bid for the TRICARE business. That's one of the biggest contracts in the country. I cannot figure that out, but someone's got to look at that. That's worth a follow-up from there. The, the, the question is, is out there always. When we talk to any of the PBMs and we say, we need greater transparency. Uh, we need to know more about the pharmacy reimbursement, the manufacturer rebates. We need that. Their response is always the same. Well, that's going to hurt the consumer. If we give you greater transparency, the consumer is going to be hurt. Now, we never, we never get an answer of what that really means. Where are they coming from on that, and does it really hurt the consumer if there's greater transparency in the PBMs? And I'll let anyone answer that that wants to be able to answer that. Mr. Burns, Dr. Burns. Well, th there's pr uh, plenty of research that shows when you start uh, mandating transparency, especially of prices, there's always a danger of collusion among the people who are uh, revealing those prices. So you always have to watch out for that. And studies show that a lot, of the, a lot of the transparency movement, which has been going on for 20 years, hasn't really benefited consumers because most consumers don't know what to do with the information. Right. The, the challenge that we have is, obviously, the consumer is paying a higher price and we all know it. The spread pricing is real. We all know it. Uh, the percentage uh, per, uh, that they're being paid is a very real issue. The rebates are not going back to the consumer. Uh, we all know all those things, and anytime we try to step in and say, okay, so let's provide some transparency to find out what's actually how many dollars are there, they're like, oh, that's going to hurt the consumer, as if everything they're already doing is not hurting the consumer.
but suddenly that piece becomes the, oh, that's going to be bad for the consumer. So th this is an issue I'm glad this committee is taking on. I'm glad y'all are here. We've got a lot more work to do. We discussed this four years ago and have done nothing about it so far. I am grateful to the Biden administration and CMS and some of the things that they're currently doing on DIR fees to step in, but it's not far enough. And we have some additional work to be able to do in this area. So I appreciate all the preparation that y'all did uh, for this hearing. I'm grateful we're having it. Thanks, y'all.